Good evening and welcome to our Good Friday service. Will you stand and worship with us?
Happy Good Friday. We are here in a, a celebration and a, a moment of, of remembrance for what we have because of Christ, for what he has accomplished on our behalf, how our lives are forever changed because of what he did nearly 2,000 years ago. So in these moments, we're going to get into what he did and what it means. But let us take a moment to pray. Father God, you are good Lord, the day that we are gathered here together, this day that you have made, Lord, let us be glad and rejoice in it because it's the day that this day uh, symbolizes and represents and we remember on this day the, the great sacrifice of Christ who, because of the great joy set before him, Lord, he endured the cross. Lord, we, we love you. We are grateful. Lord, I ask that you would turn our hearts towards your word and what your word would declare, that you would open up our hearts and be ready to sing praise to who you are and what you've done. Lord, I ask that if there be any distractions as we are in these moments, Lord, that you would guard us from those. Lord, I know that we have an enemy that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, but I know that he who is within us is greater than he who is in the world. And the enemy cannot lift one finger against you. We ask that you be with us in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So for the few minutes, uh, I'm going to have a theme verse that's going to stay up there on the screen, and that's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, this is some of the oldest words in the New Testament. Paul is referencing a, a creed that the early church had that would really predate any of the, the full gospel account books. It is an early declaration that the early church fully recognized. They were all brought together because of Christ dying for their sins in accordance with the scriptures. Now, you see words in red, in accordance with the scriptures. And it's, it's no surprise to most of y'all, one of the things that so fascinates me about the scripture is how it's interwoven how there are so many things as the story of the Bible unfolds that point to Christ, that it is so evident, the more you study, the more you get into it, that God had the destination in mind when the story started, that there is a divine hand that has been guiding us all along the way. And there's so many threads we could look at. And truth be told, if we wanted to look at all the threads in the Old Testament that lead us to the cross, we would still be here when other folks arrive for Easter morning. And we're just not going to persecute you in that way. Um, and I would probably, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'd pass out or if I would just get so tired that my words would just not make any sense anymore. But tonight we're just going to give a few things, a few ways that the scriptures, that the Old Testament points to Christ and him dying on the cross for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17 say this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we all know that they could not listen to that simple word. We all know that it just takes a few verses, it's the very next chapter later, that they disobeyed their God, that they sinned, that they brought death into the world, and they surely did not fully understand the spiritual death that happened in that sense, in that time. Paul talks about it in Romans 5, verse 12. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. 
The sin of Adam and the death brought on by that sin spread to every single one of us. It wasn't just Adam and Eve who were spiritually killed in the garden. It was going to be every man, woman, and child who would ever live. All of us. Death in that day claimed ownership over us. Death pointed at every single one and said, that one's mine. But you see, at this same time that Adam and Eve surely did not understand the full repercussions of their actions, God was going to be working a story. A story we see all the way through Scripture. I want to pick up this story in Genesis 15. And for the modern reader, Genesis 15 gets really weird really quickly. But it also is a really beautiful foreshadowing of what God is going to accomplish through Christ. Genesis 15 is when God makes his covenant with Abraham, who still goes by Abram at this time. But he makes his covenant with him. And you see, for us, when we think about covenants or or contracts, we get stuff down on paper, right? We're going to get it in writing. Hey, you do this, I'll do that, we'll sign our names, and that'll be how it goes. Well, in Abraham's day, they were a little bit more creative than that. And it's probably a good time to mention that like the, the word covenant, it, it, in Hebrew it's berif, and it, it comes from the idea of to cut. So what God told Abraham to do is to take a few animals, and he said, all right, you're going to cut these animals in half, and you're going to lay them aside so that there's like a little walkway between them. I know this is a little bit gross, a little bit graphic, but this is the story that God has written for us. And he said, when you do this, or in that time, the covenants would go, when they would set these animals out there, the idea is that both people who are agreeing to this covenant or this contract would walk between the animals, signifying that if I break my word or you break your word, it will be to us as it has been done to these animals. I will pay for breaking my word with my blood, or you will pay for breaking your word with your blood. But then the story gets really interesting. Because in Genesis 15, verse 12, this deal is supposed to go down at sundown. Here's what happens. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. You see, when this covenant was about to be made, God made Abraham take a nap. And I know there may be some sleepwalkers in here, but Abraham apparently was not a sleepwalker. Verse 17 says, When the sun did go down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. So what happened is this is an image of the presence of God. This is fire and smoke throughout the Old Testament signify God's presence. If you uh, are tuning in on Wednesday mornings to Ken's Bible study, he's going through the Old Testament, and you will see smoke and fire not just a couple times, but it appears quite often. So what does this mean? Abraham didn't go through the animals, but God did. So what, if, what does that boil down to? Well, on one level, if God were to break his covenant, he would pay with his blood. But we know that's not like God. God doesn't break his covenants, his promises, his words. He can't do that. That's, that would be against his very nature to do those things. But what if Abraham, or one of Abraham's descendants who was also put in to this covenant, what if they broke the covenant? What if they didn't live up to their end of the bargain? Well, it wasn't going to be Abraham's blood. Remember, he's taking a nap. It was going to be the blood of God. God was placing himself on the hook for the sins of man all the way back in Genesis 15. And it makes even more sense as we progress in the story to Genesis 22. And in Genesis 22, God asked the unthinkable of Abraham, who has now changed his name to Abraham or been changed to Abraham. He says in verse 2, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So the, the tension is building for Abraham. This son who he's been praying for and wanting for so long, and he finally has, God says, hey, I'm going to tell you where to sacrifice him at. And as they're traveling, Abraham just goes, and as they're traveling, Isaac's doing the math really quick and figures out the math is not mathing. He's like, we've got all the stuff to make a sacrifice, but we're missing the sacrifice. And you remember in Genesis 22, verse 8, how Abraham replies. He says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Abraham knew what God had said. 
He knew exactly what God had instructed him to do. But there was this faith going on in Abraham that said, hey, God's going to make a provision here. The author of Hebrews said that even, uh, Abraham did the math and said that even if he did sacrifice his son, that God was going to be able to raise him from the dead. But there was faith that God would provide a substitute. What does God do? In verse 13, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering. And these words are so important. In place of his son. In place of his son. God provided a sacrifice in the place of his beloved. Isaac was walking free, and that was going to be a picture for us that God was going to provide a substitute to pay for the sins that all of us had committed. That we were not going to be left on our own to figure it out. That there was a God who was going to be working in this story to make sure provision was met. He was not going to let us go and be lost forever. He was working something that we see in the life of Isaac. God was working a plan all along to offer a substitute. On the very last night with his friends, Jesus says in Luke 22, verse 37, For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Now, do you know what Jesus just referenced there when he says, and he was numbered with the transgressors? He's quoting the Old Testament. He's referencing something that had been written hundreds of years before. He's referencing Isaiah 53, verse 12. And he is saying, this is about me. Now, for the the disciples that were in the room that, that knew their scriptures, there had to have been a picture in their head. Now, wait a minute. We know what Isaiah 53 is about. They didn't have it numbered right then, but they knew what the prophet Isaiah was saying in that place. What God was going to do through something, through a suffering servant. One section of Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was telling his friends that he was the substitute. He was going to be the one that was going to be in their place. He was going to bear their griefs, carry their sorrows. He was going to have his hands and his feet pierced for their transgressions. He was going to be crushed under the weight of God's wrath instead of them in their place. This was the message that's being declared in this, that we are not left to deal with our sin on our own, but Jesus is going to stand in the gap and be our substitute, be the Lamb of God standing in our place. And through this, He could bring us healing. What kind of healing? The kind of healing that brings life to death, that those who are dead in their trespasses and sin could be made alive again with Christ. They could have hope. They could have eternity. They could be brought into a family called the family of God. They could be brought into a kingdom that shall never end. This is the healing that he was working. This was the healing he was doing. Romans 5, 8 says that God has proved his love in this way, that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was our substitute, the one in our place, the one who took every ounce, every drop of wrath that was due to us in our place. Death had declared ownership over us, but our God said, no, they are mine. Watch what I will do to bring them home. I will pay for their sins with my own blood. I will die in their place. And for us, in all the chaos and the worry and the anxiousness, when all the things seem to be going crazy and seem to be going against us, and we seem to be thinking like, how could this possibly turn out good? Good Friday declares for us that there is a God who loves us more than we could ever understand. That there is a beautiful gospel message that I've heard can be summarized in four words. Jesus in my place. Or Jesus on my cross. As our substitute. As the one who has stood in the gap for us that have taken every ounce of wrath that was due to us. The next verse after our theme verse is verse 4. 
And it says that he was buried, he was raised on the third day and according to the scriptures. In this moment, we celebrate Jesus in our place, and it also should put in us a desire to look forward with anticipation. Because he didn't just die in our place, he also got up. He also rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. He said, death, you shall not win today. He said, sin, your days are done. He's, the Satan, everything that he wanted to accomplish has now been defeated. In closing, I want to tell you about a pastor named S.M. Lockridge. In 1953, Pastor Lockridge became the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church of San Diego, California. And he pastored there for 40 years up until 1993. In the year 2000, the Lord called him home. But in his ministry, he preached a Good Friday sermon that really gets so much to the heart of this day. It's become quite famous. I'm sure many of you have heard words from it. If you haven't heard words from this sermon, you've heard uh, Phil Wickham's song that is strongly influenced by this sermon. And though I will not do it justice, because I lack the rhythmic skill to do it justice, I think the words are quite powerful. Remember, Jesus in my place. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary is crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. Body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning and evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raise him up next to criminals. But it's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Father God, I come to you grateful that you and your sovereignty have worked a plan of salvation from the foundations of the earth. Lord, you looked upon us and knew our shortcomings. You knew that with, pre with us being presented a choice, we would choose that which is wrong. Lord, you knew that we would come up short. And even still, your love was declared and you created us and you made us and you walked with us. You created a plan that we could be brought back into your family. Lord, though our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, were cast out of Eden, you have worked a plan to bring us back there. Lord, I am grateful that we can say, Jesus in my place, Jesus on my cross, that my sin is no longer the weight that will hold me down, but I now have victory because of what Christ has done. I have freedom because of what Christ has done. Lord, that there is nothing that Satan can do. For there is not one thing that can remove me from your grasp. Lord, on this Friday, we celebrate the Good Friday, where the greatest injustice in the history of mankind was ever committed and the only purely innocent one was murdered on a cross that he willingly took for the joy that was set before him. But Lord, in this Friday, we are filled with gratitude that we now stand justified. All who believe because of what you have done. And Lord, let this build an anticipation for Sunday. That Sunday is a coming, Lord. There is a time when even the grave could not hold you down, but you got up with victory. Oh, where is your sting death? Where is your victory sin? Where is any plan that you set forth, Satan, that could ever be accomplished? Because now our Jesus has defeated the grave. Amen. Lord, I ask that you would fill us with this confidence that you are exactly who you say that you are. You have proven it. You've proven your love on the cross and you've proven your power by rising from the grave. And Lord, let us now come to a place where we raise clean hands because you have cleaned them. And let us worship you 
the only one in all of existence who is worthy of every ounce of worship. Let it be. Amen.
Thanks for coming. Ushers, if you will step in, make sure everyone has your communion cup. If you did not pick one on the way in, raise your hand and these handsome gentlemen will run to you. Looks like everybody's covered. Okay, good, 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 good. This, I only had this idea sitting over there. Uh, Charles, if you can figure out how to bring the house lights down. I know you have to keep the stage lights up, but you can bring the house lights down. So, Matt, first of all, thank you, buddy, for doing such a great job. Uh, from here on out, it's going to be up to you. Uh, the responsibilities is going to happen in your heart and in your mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read all of the uh, Last Supper uh, passages in the Gospels, and then I'm going to finish with what Paul had to say about it in Corinthians. So the best I can do is read it to you. It will appear on the screen if you have your, well, you can't see your Bible now. Uh, but I want you to just look and listen and allow your senses to engage, to understand that we're, write, we're reading something that at, when, it was, when, it, when it happened, the world could not even conceive of it. The men in the room could not begin to wrap their minds around it. Only from this side of the tomb are we able to read what they experienced and begin to grasp the incredible depth of it. And so I'm going to pray just for the Lord to help me be able to read and for you to be able to hear it and experience it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how beautiful and powerful and amazing it is. May the same Holy Spirit that inspired the remembering and the recording of the things that happened in that room that night, 
Holy Spirit, we're asking you to come into this room and that you will take all of us back there and we will hear these words and we will hear what Jesus is saying and that we will realize what he's describing is his death. That he is giving them a symbol, giving them a token that they will be able to reach out and take hold of again and again and again, but they had no way of knowing that you were describing your death. And so help us tonight to enter into these very dark and somber moments and help us to truly, truly connect with what you did for us. And we praise your holy name. Amen. Matthew 26, 17 reads, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, Jesus reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? And he answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Mark chapter 14. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Luke 22, verse 14. And when the hour came, 
He reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you, I'm sorry, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord... We are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is God's Word. I'm wondering if maybe you just realized how many times the betrayal of Judas is referenced. And how while they were in the upper room, Jesus called their attention to the reality of that, to the trauma of that, to the devastation of that. I, I, I will remind you that Jesus gives no space for Judas. He doesn't dismiss it. He doesn't try to dis diminish it. He just lays it out there. The other thing that gets my attention about that is that no one in the room knew except Jesus and Judas. None of the twelve, or the eleven, I should say, none of them were sitting, go, sitting going, hmm, I think I know who it is. No, they were questioning themselves. Jesus allowed that space for them to look into their own hearts and in their own minds, into their own lives, and, and search out in themselves if there was the capacity to betray Him. I'm sure as you read it, you were also reminded of the brutality 
They did not know it. They did not understand it. Jesus knew it. He knew what was coming. He was fully aware. He was completely human, but completely God and aware of what was coming his way. He knew it was going to be awful. And so as you and I are here tonight and we are remembering and reflecting on this, remember, at this point in history that we celebrate, he's dead. He's dead. On that Friday night, he is in the tomb. His body is wrapped and he is dead. He said all of this, knowing what was going to happen and expressing a level of faith that is beyond anything we can even begin to imagine. But he held on to the promises of God. When we celebrate communion, when we, when we have the Last Supper, when we have the Lord's Supper, we are identifying ourselves with that night and with all of the emotion and with all the things that happened and then all of the things that happened in the next few days. And so take your serving in your hands. You may not be used to the word meditate. You may not even be comfortable with the word meditate. But as much as you can understand what that word means, I want you to think about, I want you to meditate on the suffering of Jesus. The crown of thorns. The horrible nails. The anguish of hanging with no position for relief, but an intersection of such pain and such suffering that quickly sapped the life from his body. Meditate on the cross. Jesus, tonight, help us to not be distracted or deceived, but to remember that when your word says, by his stripes we are healed, those stripes were real. Those stripes were paying the sin debt that we owe because those stripes took from you your life. The hemorrhaging on the cross and the death that was caused was because of our sin. Help us not shy away from it. Help us not doubt it or deny it. Help us to lean in and know that you did it so that we could be forgiven. The 
The second thing I want you to, to embrace, the thing that I want you to meditate on, is that we know, all, we know that Judas was the one who betrayed him and he sought to do it with a kiss and we, and we know the treachery of that and how terrible that was. But I want to bring you back to something that all of the gospel accounts told us, that all 12 of those men questioned themselves. All 12 of those men meditated on what was happening and, and were looking into their own hearts and lives. And if they could tell you now, they would have all told you that they saw the cracks in their own faith. They, they saw the weaknesses in their own lives. They had boasted earlier, but in these moments, I'm convinced with all of my heart that, that they understood they were all capable. And the thing that Paul drives home is that before we take this, we must examine ourselves. And as you examine yourself, whatever you find, the, the t most terrible, the dirtiest, the greatest failing, the thing for which you are the most ashamed, the thing that even disgusts you now, as you begin to think about it and allow it to come to the surface, and we'll pray the Holy Spirit brings it to the surface for you. But what I want you to remember is the blood you hold in your hand has cleansed you of that sin. As real as that cup is in your hand, the blood that drained from the body of Jesus, the life that drained from the body of Jesus is the blood that paid your sin debt. And whatever it is that you see in there, you are forgiven. If we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will you look into your heart and bring all of the darkness into the life-giving blood of the Lamb? Meditate and pray. Jesus, we bring you all of the darkness. We bring you all of the dark and deadly sins of our life. We examine ourselves. And we invite you, O oh Lord, to shine the, the searchlight of heaven into our souls and to show us, show us everything. And those in this room who struggle with guilt and shame and live broken because of the past, cause them tonight to know like never before that your grace is sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. Would every one of you in this room, and if you're watching online, would, would you say that to Jesus right now about whatever it is that grieves you, shames you, bruises you, wounds you, would you bring it to Him? Would you say, your grace is sufficient. Your blood was enough. Your death 
is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Are you listening right now? Listen to me. The blood of Jesus is enough for you. The death of Jesus is enough for you. We come against the lies of Satan and the, and the voices in the dark, and we declare that the blood of Jesus is enough. His grace is enough for you. His grace is enough for you. Lord Jesus, tonight we remember. We remember that you were in a room full of broken men who would fail you, who would run away, who would be ashamed. Tonight we identify with Peter who, who was the most vocal of them all. What Judas did was beyond anything we can understand or comprehend. But we all know what it's like to be Peter. And tonight we thank you that your blood is enough, that your grace is enough, that your death was enough, that your resurrection is enough. And so we come tonight to bless you and praise you and to thank you. And we exalt your name. Amen. You can bring the lights back up. I want you to be able to see how to maneuver this. There are two layers for those of you who maybe this is your first time with us. There's a little cellophane layer on top. If you will pull it, it will expose only the little wafer. He reached out, took hold of a loaf of unleavened bread tore it into 12 pieces and sent it around the table. He blessed it. Father, thank you for this little piece of bread and the symbol and the reminder that it is. And we praise you and thank you for it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Eat it. Father, thank you for the juice that represents the wine that is a picture of the blood that you shed for us. The men in that room that night did not yet understand the price you would pay to forgive them of their sin. And we sit here tonight fully aware that your death, the shedding of your blood like a Passover lamb, frees us, forgives us, and makes new life possible for us. Thank you for this cup. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink all of it. If you don't remember anything else from tonight, remember this. Jesus paid it all.
and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Amen. Are there enough old people in here to sing that? Would you stand up with me? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. I love you. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday morning. You're dismissed.